This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 21 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Chapter 19 The Dip. For a week, Boston Red is absent from work. My best efforts seem ineffectual in the face of the increasing mountain of unturned hosiery, and the officer grows more irritable and insistent. But the fear of clogging the industrial will presently forces him to give me assistance, and a dapper young man, keen-eyed and nervous, takes the vacant place. He's a dip, Johnny Davis whispers to me, a top-notcher, he adds admiringly. I experience a tinge of resentment at the equality implied by the forced association. I have never before come in personal contact with a professional thief, and I entertain the vaguest ideas concerning his class. But they are not producers, hence parasites, who deliberately prey upon society, upon the poor mostly. There can be nothing in common between me and this man. The new helper's conscience superiority is provoking. His distant manner piques my curiosity. How unlike his scornful mien and proudly independent bearing is my youthful impression of a thief. Vividly I remember the red-headed Kolya as he was taken from the classroom by a fierce gendarme. The boys had been missing their lunches and Kolya confessed to the theft. We ran after the prisoner, and he hung his head and looked frightened, and so pale I could count each freckle on his face. He did not return to school, and I wondered what had become of him. The terror in his eyes haunted my dreams, the brown spots on his forehead shaping themselves into fiery letters, spelling the fearful word vor that's a snap the helper's voice breaks in on my reverie he speaks in well-modulated tones the accents nasal and decided you needn't be afraid to talk he adds patronizingly i am not afraid i impatiently resent the insinuation why should i be afraid of you not of me of the officer i meant i am not afraid of him either well then let's talk about something it will help while away the time you know his cheerful friendliness smooths my ruffled temper the correct english in striking contrast with the peculiar language of my former assistant surprises me i am sorry he continues they gave you such a long sentence Mr. Berkman, but how do you know my name? I interrupt. You have just arrived. They call me Lightning Al, he replies with a tinge of pride. I'm here only three days, but a fellow in my line can learn a great deal in that time. I had you pointed out to me. What do you call your line? What are you here for? For a moment he is silent. With surprise, I watch his face blush darkly. You're a dead giveaway. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Berkman. He corrects himself. I sometimes lapse into lingo under provocation, you know. I meant to say it's easy to see that you are not next to the way, not familiar, I mean, with such things. You should never ask a man what he is in for. Why not? Well, um, uh, you are ashamed. Not a bit of it. Ashamed to fall, perhaps. I mean, to be caught at it. It's no credit to a gun's rep, his reputation, you understand. But I'm proud of the jobs I've done. I'm pretty slick, you know. 
but you don't like to be asked why you were sent here. Well, it's not good manners to ask such questions. Against the ethic of the trade, I suppose? How sarcastic we can be, Mr. Berkman. But it's true. It's not the ethics. And isn't a trade either. It's a profession. Oh, you may smile, but I'd rather be a gun, a professional, I mean, than one of your stupid factory hands. They are honest, though, honest producers, while you're a thief. Oh, there is no sting in that word for me. I take pride in being a thief. And what's more, I am an A number one gun. You see the point? The best dip in the States. A pickpocket? Stealing nickels of passengers on the streetcars and... Me? A hell of a lot you know about it. Take me for such a small fry, do you? I work only on race tracks. You call it work? Sure, damn hard work too. Takes more brains than a whole shopful of your honest producers can show. And you prefer that to being honest? Do I? I spend more on gloves than a bricklayer makes in a year. Think I'm so dumb I have to slave all week for a few dollars? But you spent most of your life in prison. Not by a long shot. A real good gun's always got his full money planted. I mean, some ready coin in case of trouble. And a smart lawyer will spring you most every time. Beat the case, you know. I've never seen the fly cup you couldn't fix if you got enough dough, and most judges too. Of course, now and then the best of us may fall, but it don't happen very often, and it's all in the game. The whole life is game, Mr. Bergman, and everyone's got his graft. Do you mean there are no honest men? I ask angrily. Sure. I'm just as honest as Rockefeller or Carnegie, only they got the law with them. And I work harder than they, I'll bet you on that. I've got to eat, haven't I? Of course, he adds thoughtfully. If I could be sure of my bread and butter, perhaps. The passing overseer smiles at the noted pickpocket, inquiring pleasantly, How are you doing, Al? Tip-top, Mr. Carson. Hope you're feeling good today. Never better, Al. A friend of mine often spoke to me about you, Mr. Carson. Who was that? Barney. Jack Barney. Jack Barney? Why, he worked for me in the broom shop. Yes, he did, a three-spot. He often said to me, Al, if you ever land in Riverside, he says, be sure you don't forget to give my best to Mr. Carson. Mr. Ed Carson, he says. He's a good fellow. The officer looked pleased. Yes, I treated him quite all right, he remarks, continuing on his rounds. I knew he'd swallow it, the assistant sneers after him. Always good to get on the right side of them. He adds with a wink. Barney told me about him all right, said he's the rottenest sneak in the dump, a swell head. Yep. You say, Mr. Berkman... May I call you Alec? It's shorter. Well, you see, Alec, I make it a point to find things out. It's wise to know the ropes. I'm next to the whole bunch here. That Jimmy McPain, the deputy, he's a regular brute. Killed his man all right. Barney told me all about it. He was doing his bit then. I mean, serving his sentence, you see, Alec. He lowers his voice confidentially. I don't like to use slang. It grows on one, and every fly cop can spot you as a crook. It's necessary in my business to present a fine front and use good English, so I must not get the lingo habit. Well, I was speaking of Barney telling me about the deputy. He killed a con in cold blood. The fellow was Bughouse, D.T., you know, saw snakes. He ran out of his cell one morning, swinging a chair and hollering, Murder! Kill him! The deputy was just passing along, and he out with his gad. I mean, his revolver, you know, 
and bangs away. He pumped the poor loony fellow full of holes. He did, the murderer. Killed him dead. Never was tried, either. Warden told the newspapers it was done in self-defense. A damn lie. Sandy knew better. Everybody in the dump knew it was cold-blooded murder, with no provocation at all. It's a regular ring, you see, and that old warden is the biggest grafton of them all. And that sky pilot, too, is an A-1 fakir. Did you mean about the kid born here? Before your time? A big scandal. Since then, the holy man's got to have a screw with him at Sunday service for the females. And I tell you, he needs watching all right. The whistle terminates the conversation. End of section 21. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchists.